Hey everybody, and welcome to this session of the Online Ocean Symposium. In this episode, we will be discussing the state of the climate, what the data is telling us, and where we go from here to really enact change. We have a lot to tackle today, and a panel of heavy hitters, so let's dive right in. First, I'd like to welcome back to the program James Jacobson. James is a data analyst with NASA's Operation Icebridge, which is a project to measure, record, and analyze data on the Arctic ice shelf. Welcome back, James. Thank you, Andrew. I'm glad to be back. No problem. So last time you were on the program, you were in Greenland tirelessly working on uh, your frozen landscape to get a measurement of our planet's health. Um, you've seen calving and melting firsthand. What do you see out there? What type of data have you been collecting? And uh, what, from your observations, uh, have you seen? So, uh, so that's a, it's a great question because uh, with, with IceBridge, uh, we're really collecting a lot of different kinds of data. We're collecting um, you know, LIDAR measurements of, of the surface. We're collecting uh, different uh, wavelengths of radar data that are actually penetrating the ice sheet and telling us how, how thick the ice actually is at any given location. Uh, we're also taking, you know, huge volumes of uh, airborne photographic data, uh, as well as, you know, like gravimeter. I mean, it's it's a, it's a really great platform for science because, you know, we're on these old uh, P3 aircraft, uh, and they're just they're just these amazing workforces, and you can put a lot of scientists and a lot of uh, a lot of instruments on in one place. Um, in terms of uh, what the data is telling us, I mean, I, I've been now to to Greenland twice for for this mission. I've been to um, to the Antarctic once, um, and you know, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I should I should throw this caveat out there that I'm not speaking directly for NASA or for um, or for my group and doing this as sort of a favor for uh, for Andrew here, and I don't really want to overstep my boundaries, but uh, you know, I mean it. It was certainly clear to me from the first time that I went to the next time that, you know, the ice as it is is getting much thinner. Certainly in Antarctica. I can't speak as, as well from personal experience in, in the Antarctic. Um, and we have, uh, we have a lot of um, data. I mean, we, we get terabytes and terabytes of data every time we go. And a lot of it is housed at the, uh, the um, National Center for uh, Snow and Ice, the NSIDC. And if you guys want any of it, you are more than welcome to go there, put in a request, and they'll they'll give it to you for free. Um, and I think I don't think anyone's going to be surprised when you know they see that the trends that uh, the NSIAC posts are things like the Arctic ice is is diminishing, while um, Antarctic ice seems to be seems to be increasing, though not in a rate at which to offset uh, the loss. That's pretty much what I can speak on at that point. Well, thank you for sharing all that with us, and I'm sure that uh, most of our viewers who are interested in data will be right on that, and you'll have tons more requests than you uh, really can handle. Uh, next up, we have uh, Noah Diffenbaum, a senior fellow and associate professor at Stanford, focusing on climate and food security. Welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. It's great to be here. Awesome. Uh, so you are currently focusing on climate trends and uh, future impact. From your experience, what does the future kind of look like? Uh, well, uh, you know, we're we're trying to understand a noisy system uh, while it's changing, and it, it, you know, we we know from from a, a wide array of of uh, evidence of observations that the global climate system is changing and and that that there are impacts that are already emerging um, in different regions of the globe so this is uh, th there's really no no scientific question about whether global warming is occurring uh, the question about what does the future hold is uh, is more complicated because the the future hasn't happened yet we can't we can't observe the future until it happens so uh, you know, we're we're trying to understand how how risks uh, of different kinds of impacts uh, are evolving uh, as as global warming is unfolding, and and you know, my research group is is most interested in the interface between uh, physical climate processes that that make the the weather that we experience on a, on a day to day basis, and the impacts that that uh, that the climate has on on us uh, uh, humans and other living things. So we end up uh, focused on um, events like heat waves and, and severe thunderstorms and, and 
extreme rainfall and flooding because that's really where where humans feel the climate system most directly. So what you're talking about right now is things like 100-year events, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that you just recently came out with uh, was a paper in regards to the rate of occurrence for climate change. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. So uh, uh, my, my colleague Chris Field and I had a, a review paper in Science a few weeks ago, uh, which was part of a, a special issue on uh, natural systems in changing climates. And, and so there were a series of papers looking at how natural systems uh, have responded to climate changes uh, at different times in Earth history. And so we were assessing uh, the, the published literature on, um, on the recent climate change that's been observed, uh, our, our physical understanding of how climate change is likely to change and how climate is likely to change in the future, and then also comparing those with the geologic record. And so uh, we, we look back at the literature uh, of um, papers that have assessed global scale temperature change at different times uh, since the extinction of the dinosaurs last 65 million years and tried to compare those uh, rates and magnitude of, of global temperature change with what's likely to happen over the next century. And uh, what's very clear from that comparison is that uh, in, in the last 65 million years, there have been periods where global temperature has changed uh, on the order of one degree, five degrees, even 10 degrees, but that those transitions occurred over much longer periods of time. So tens of thousands of years, millions of years. So really the combination of rate and magnitude of change that's likely to occur uh, if greenhouse gas concentrations continue to increase as they have is unprecedented in the last 65 million years. And that's quite a long time for a lack of a precedent. Um, you are also currently holding various climate discussion hangouts through Google Plus Hangouts. How have those been going? Uh, I enjoy it. Um, you know, I'm... Um, my my research group, um, some of my time is, is funded by uh, grants from from the federal government, and you know, I think it's an important responsibility that those of us who receive funding from from the taxpayers to to engage with the public to answer questions when we're asked. Uh, and I found that uh, you know this is a, a great opportunity to engage directly with people from all over the country and all over the world, uh, and and just have a conversation about what we understand, what we don't understand, and, and in particular what the latest research is. I think that in my experience, you know, a lot of the discussion that happens in public about climate change is, is around the most the most current research, the paper that just came out uh, this week. And um, you know that that's it, it can be a challenge to to uh, even for us as scientists to assimilate all of the new information uh, that, that, that's coming out. And so you know, it's particularly challenging for the public who has some other life that isn't keeping up with the climate literature. No, most definitely. Well, keep up the good work and continue to inform people and make sure that it's a little bit more digestible for uh, individuals who might not have the necessary time to uh, absorb it all. Next up, I'd like to introduce a personal hero of mine. A journalist and climate activist since the late 1980s, co-founder of 350.org, Bill McKibben. Welcome to the program. Very good to be with you. Well, thank you. Um, when you originally co-founded 350.org, the purpose was to draw attention to the amount of carbon in our atmosphere. What does 350 signify for those who don't know? Well, I don't know. 350 is probably the most important number on the planet. We just didn't know it till 2008 when... Uh, Jim Hansen and his team at NASA put out a paper saying 350 parts per million is the most CO2 we can safely have in the atmosphere above that. Or, uh, if we want a planet, they said, similar to the one on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. And we decided we actually did like um, human civilization, life on Earth, all those things. So um, um, we formed 350.org. And uh, we've had some luck with it. People said, oh, this will be too complicated. No one will under, you know, it's a scientific data point. Why would you use that as a name? But uh, we wanted to be able to both communicate the science and to work across international linguistic boundaries. And we've had some success with that. We think 350.org has coordinated about 20,000 demonstrations in every country on the planet except North Korea. 
Um, we've helped spearhead the fight against the Keystone Pipeline in this country, and now uh, at places like NOAA's Stanford and 379 other college campuses, we're helping work hard for uh, the divestment of these institutions from the fossil fuel industry uh, so we can actually start doing something about this problem. That's fantastic. Uh, I actually have participated in a couple of different rallies myself. Uh, I was wondering if you could touch a little bit more upon the actual number that you're describing, sure. and what it means that we're now uh, apparently past 400 parts per million. Well, what it means is we're too high. I mean, we're like the guy who went to the doctor, and the doctor said, uh, you know what, your cholesterol is in that zone where people have heart attacks. Um, heart attacks, in this case, look like the Arctic melting. They look like the ocean becoming 30% more acidic than it was 40 years ago, and they look like the atmosphere becoming about 5% wetter, loading the dice for drought and floods. Day to day, I mean, it just looks like, uh, you know, increasingly like hell. Uh, go up, you know, uh, 100 or 200 miles from where Noah is today, from Stanford, and you'll uh, find the largest wildfire in the history of California's Sierras. Uh, you'll find it um, burning, in fact, directly into the heart of Yosemite, where John Muir, 100 and some years ago, invented the modern environmental movement. Um, you'll find it threatening two of the three groves of sequoias, some of the biggest and oldest things on our planet. Um, um, you'll find it making it hard for people to breathe uh, uh, for you know, huge stretches of the inner mountain west. That's what it looks like in one small corner of uh, this planet on one given day. They're actually talking about how it might even uh, impact the Hetch Hetchy, which is very scary for everybody in San Francisco and everybody who relies on that as a water supply. Uh, I wanted to also uh, bring it to the fact that you have been working on educating the public on climate and our impact on the world since, again, the late 1980s. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know, from your perspective, has this conversation gotten easier? Are more people actually understanding our impact? Is it getting harder? Can you speak to your perspective on that? Uh, yes, I think the conversation's definitely gotten easier. The data shows a huge spike in the percentage of Americans concerned about climate change. Now, I wish I could take credit for a lot of that. I mean, I did write the first book about all this, but in fact, I think it's... um. Mother Nature that's really acting as the recruiting sergeant here. More than 80% of U.S. counties have had a federally declared disaster in the last two years. At a certain point, that opens people's eyes. Uh, you know, last year we watched the Atlantic Ocean pour into the New York City subway system. Anybody who had any doubts left about the fragility of our technological civilization in the face of the forces we've unleashed should have had them answered then. So I think not only are people educated, I think they're willing to act. Yale published a poll this week that blew my mind. I think it was Yale. It showed that 12 or 13 percent of Americans are now at the point where they're willing to commit civil disobedience in order to to do something to prevent climate change. Um, um, that's pretty amazing. If that's true, then the fossil fuel industry should be worried. Their days of dominating this political debate are are going to come to an end. Um, uh, you know, I don't say it happily. I, I, going to jail, I, which I've now done um, a couple of times, is not fun, but um, it's not the end of the world either. The end of the world is the end of the world, and that's what all these numbers point to, and that's why we've got to act now. Yeah, there's actually another article that went out recently about how we as a society need to be a little bit more afraid of the impacts of climate change and what where it can be going, where it can uh, actually end up. Um, apart from civil disobedience and actually rioting in the street, from your experience, what is a good way for people at home to get involved? So we're really against rioting in the street, um, um, it must be said. Uh, we think, I think that would be the, uh, the least useful thing anyone could do and uh, put me down on the anti-rioting side at all times. Um, what people can do at home is join together with other people, organize. Um, uh, you know, everybody knows they should change their light bulb and ride their bike. By now, I assume most of the people watching this are doing it. Um, but we can't make the math of climate change work just that way alone. This is a structural problem that will require a structural solution. The most obvious of those, which every economist has pointed out for decades now, is that uh, the fossil fuel industry should not be the sole industry on the planet allowed to pour its waste into the atmosphere for free. Were we to put a serious price on carbon, 
we would not solve this problem, but we would make all the solutions that we have in hand easier. And the good news is uh, those solutions get better all the time. There were days this summer when Germany generated half the power it used from solar panels within its borders. And that's Germany. Think what a country might do that had, oh, I don't know, California, Texas, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, Florida, Utah, Tennessee, the Carolinas, uh, Georgia, Alabama uh, to work with. Um, it might really get somewhere. That would be definitely fantastic. Um, I wanted to just uh, point back a little bit and give a shout out to uh, the NASA Airborne Sensor Facility. Uh, Bill, you mentioned the current wildfire in Yosemite, and they are the ones who are currently doing some data collection and flying over there to uh, monitor that. And I just wanted to say thank you to uh, NASA for continuing to keep an eye on everything. Uh, not only that, not only that, they're providing beautiful pictures, powerful, scary pictures of what it looks like from uh, outer space. NASA's, you know, long debated mission to planet Earth is incredibly important and thank heaven we have NASA and NOAA and others keeping track of what's going on on this planet. Uh, we need that data and we need it really bad. Yeah, most definitely. Speaking of NOAA, uh, that actually leads me to my next guest, uh, Roger from uh, NOAA. Can you uh, say hi? Hi there. Hi. Um, so you are a uh, person who works on climate impact for NOAA. Can you speak a little bit to what that is, what you do? Sure. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. And great set of lead-ins uh, there. From the standpoint of NOAA, and Bill and others have mentioned this, um, uh, you know, we support things like the National Snow and Ice Data Center that was just mentioned, a lot of activities that are related to measuring the pulse of the Earth. Where's What's happening to ocean heat content? What's happening to the air temperatures? What's happening in terms of tracking um, you know, number of hurricanes, things like that? Not by ourselves, but certainly in partnership with folks like NOAA and uh, the other NOAA you know, and others uh, around the globe. And so the partnership between the NOAA and NASA, the feds and so on is pretty important. That's sort of keeping the pulse. Where folks like myself come in is um, we work a great deal on the so what kind of question, the types of things the bill was getting to, which is so what does this mean? So what if things are changing? How, do, how are we responding? Communication is really important, but you know, fundamental values that people have are not simply changed through communication. It's changed through whether or not the awareness increases, but people have pathways for action as well. So what I do with a group of folks in things like the Regional Integrated Science and Assessment, which is you know, 11 centers around the country, the National Integrated Drought Information System, that are all within um, the group that I'm in at NOAA, we work very closely nationally and internationally with what are the impacts, how can we respond, what are the most effective ways of doing that that don't create other risks, uh, what are the partnerships between folks who are doing the basic science research, the public, the private sector, on trying to come up with actionable solutions, but then finding the support to doing them. Anybody can recommend anything about what somebody else ought to do. That's not an uncommon thing. Um, but in terms of actually doing it, that's, that's not an uncontentious thing. So let's take a few examples. You look at the fires that are happening right now. Of course, we're working on are dry conditions likely to continue. You look at the Colorado River for the first time in the history of the building of um, uh, Glen Canyon Dam, uh, water deliveries to the lower basin is being cur curtailed this year by one million acre feet out of 8.25. So there are some changes occurring. They're not all tied to anthropogenic change. They're tried, tied to how what our land use is, the fact that we are here now. And there's a strong component of the link between weather and climate that we work on, which is when you have a background change in temperature or a change that is occurring, and then you put something like a drought on that or you put um, other types of storms on that. What type of events are you really looking at? So from our standpoint, we try to build these partnerships across the feds, the states, tribal communities, and the private sector on how most effectively might we respond. And then what's the cost of doing that? And what's the benefits of doing so? A great part of what NOAA does is develop information systems um, that work with people not only on, hey, here's, here's here, a drought is likely, sayonara, we've done our job, but much more from the standpoint of, is it likely to be more severe? 
how can we best work with you, the Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation, the states, the tribes, on responding to that. And from that standpoint, we have, as, as you know, coming out relatively soon, the National Climate Assessment, the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report. We just did the IPCC Special Report on Extremes with uh, the UN, all pointing to the fact that this bridge between weather and climate is pretty critical for how societies and communities respond. And that's the kind of work I do, in addition to setting up teams of uh, multidisciplinary research folks to try to address that question. So, Roger, you kind of touched upon this. Uh, recently, the State of the Climate came out, um, the 2012 State of the Climate came out. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that said, like in a sentence or two? Yeah, so one of the things we've been seeing is you, you, you know, in that document, is certainly very direct um, uh, impacts of a varying and changing climate. You know, not all tied to anthropogenic change, but certainly ch tied to some transitions that are occurring. And I think Noah mentioned this. And one of the most critical things we're looking at are rapid rates of change. So the ocean heat content is certainly the highest it's been since 1950. Sea ice loss, and certainly in the Arctic, um, uh, the highest since uh, we've been keeping accurate records in 1979. Um, and of course it slowed down in 2013. It's been a slightly cooler year in the Arctic even though it's been warm here. Um, on the Greenland ice sheet, we can certainly see the temperature changes over land increasing. But one of the most critical things that happened last year was this very dramatic uh, sea ice loss that occurred uh, in the Arctic. Um, certainly higher than we've ever seen. This year it's a little slower. In fact, it's about 1.2 square kilometers less than it was last year. In other words, the loss is not as dramatic. But something else was occurring from a climate standpoint that is as important to us. As you know, there's the 2012 drought last year that covered an area that was um, the only previous time that more than 60% uh, of the nation was covered in um, moderate to severe drought for five months was 1934. Um, some of you on the call might remember that. But the issue, the other issue, of course, are things like Hurricane Sandy, and it describes much more from the standpoint of, uh, you know, can we attribute this to anthropogenic change, but more from a usable standpoint, what does this teach us about the risks and how we might manage them? Because that's the valuable lesson out of this, right? Some of these things, some of the impacts that we're projecting into the future are beyond just adaptation practices, but there are a whole lot of activities out there that we can address. Last year we had something very interesting happening, which is the conditions for El Nino and La Nina, which you usually see one or the other during the year, neither of them happened. And what did that tell us? It told us that things on the 10 to 20 year time scale, stuff in the um, Atlantic, a warm Atlantic, a cold Pacific, the changes on what we call a decadal time scale, greater than 10 to 20 years, actually dominated the U.S. climate. So it tells you that if the background climate is varying and changing, you can have pretty severe events. You don't just need the seasonal to year to year impacts. And the rich story there is that impacts matter along all of these time scales. From May to July of last year, the aerial extent of drought in the U.S. jumped from 35 percent to 60 percent. That was strictly due to internal variability of the atmosphere. So when you have a warmer background, you have a decadal change, and then you have weather events occurring, what we produce are surprises in the system. Some things that are outside what the model projections are telling us on the climate change time scale. A few surprises in the system. But there are things we can do about many of those, and a lot of them are not that cost intensive, and a lot of them offer uh, economic benefits of the kind that um, you know, Bill was just talking about in terms of renewables and so on. Well, most definitely. Uh, you've given us quite a bit to think about and a bit to chew on. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, our final guest to this uh, program, which is Kate Shepard, a political and climate reporter for who has been working with Grist, Mother Jones, and is currently a senior reporter at Huffington Post. Welcome to the symposium, Kate. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem, thank you. So you have seen the ebb and flow of the political debate. Um, surrounding climate change, et cetera. Where do we currently stand on that issue? Well, you know, in 2009, there was this huge push to pass a cap-and-trade bill in Congress. You know, it passed in the House. It never went anywhere in the Senate. kind of died off for a while. I think that conversation was really revived in June with President Obama's big climate speech that he gave that outlined 
some new initiatives that the uh, executive branch is going to undertake and also directed the EPA and other agencies to start doing more on climate change themselves. I mean, most important being new regulations on, coal, on a power plants from the, the EPA that are in the works right now. So I think that's really revived the debate here in Washington eh, to some extent. Um, you know, everybody's still on recess here and for another week and a half, but I think we're going to have some real discussions about climate again in Washington this fall. Um, and, and obviously there, you know, there are other outside forces that are affecting this as well. I mean, obviously uh, 350 and, and all bills work on the Keystone Pipeline is really pushing the administration on climate um, as well. And um, I think the, the, the extreme weather events that we've seen in the last uh, few years have also pushed the, con the, the public conversation forward, too. So I think it's, it, it's ripe to have a, a sort of deeper, more important discussion here in Washington again. So in regards to the EPA, et cetera, do you think that uh, part of uh, Obama's initiative and direction is going to possibly give those agencies a little bit more teeth in order to uh, enact more change? Well, I mean, the, the, the real core of the, the work on it is happening at EPA anyway. It was, it was in the works regardless. I think the president's speech puts some more uh, pressure on them to act faster and laid out a time frame to get the rules, particularly for existing coal-fired power plants. Um, that was a big deal. Um, and to push forward on the rules for new coal-fired power plants. I think it will move some things faster, and it puts the weight of the administration uh, and obviously the, the president's um, bully pulpit behind that effort. So that's important. Um, I, yeah, I, th I think that's probably... They, they did some other things that would give more power to the agencies to do things strictly on climate adaptation and doing more public outreach on climate change. And that's important, too, but, I mean, the most important stuff is what was already underway at the EPA anyway, I think. All right. Well, uh, in your reporting, you've actually uh, worked on issues such as climate adaptation, coastal cities, etc., fracking gag orders, and suspicious editorial staffs at other agencies. Um, why are these stories important? Can you speak to what you see as the current discourse of the media on subjects like this? Well, you know, I think it's it's sort of this 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 weird tension right now is that I think the public is more interested in climate change than they've ever been before. I mean, I know that because people respond to stories that I'm writing, they respond to the stories that my colleagues are writing on the subject. People want news and, and good information on this, but at the same time, I think I'll, you've seen a lot of newspapers and, and, and other outlets cut their environment staff and cut their editors and reporters who are working on these issues full time, and so you're seeing this sort of situation where the biggest news organizations have really cut back on their environmental coverage and that's created this this sort of gap and I think increasingly you're seeing more and more um, smaller publications or specialty publications uh, filling the gap and stepping up and, and doing a lot of that important climate coverage that we weren't seeing uh, at the, the major sources of, of, of news anymore. Right. Well, I, you know, you were also recently on an MSNBC climate change hangout earlier this month talking about some of the positives in the climate discussion. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to what came out of, uh, of that discussion. Like, what was your takeaways from that? Well, you know, one of the hardest things about covering climate change is that it's most often always bad news, right? It's, there's mm -hmm. never really any good news about melting ice caps or, or, or wildfires or um, cities dealing with uh, sea level rise or storm surge. You know, those are, those are bad news stories, and it's, it's hard, I think, as readers to always be reading bad news. So I think it's really important that we also tell good news stories about what, what is happening already and, and, and creative solutions that people have undertaken on climate change. Um, I've been covering some coastal adaptation issues um, that I think are, are important and they show that communities are already seeing the, the implications of climate change and trying to find ways to solve those problems and trying to protect their communities and make them more resilient. Um, you know, some of the good news stories that I talked about were um, I think that the, the U.S. military is making some pretty big investments in, in green energy and looking at biofuels and really looking at how to make their own coastal infrastructure safer. I mean, I think it shows you that they're taking it seriously and also that they are solutions-minded. And, you know, we're not all just running around saying, oh, my God, there's nothing we can do about climate change, but, you know, looking at real clear solutions. And I think those stories are really important because if you just tell people the bad news, they say, oh, well, that's terrible. What am I going to do about it? But they need to hear the good news, too, so that they know, you know, what role they can play in, in changing in changing the, the outcomes. Mm. 
Yeah, no, we don't want people to shut down. We want to be able to actually have some sort of action as a result of this and be able to move forward. Um, so I guess now we're just going to go right into our discussion questions since that's a perfect lead into it. Um, my first question for the panel is, what uh, does the current state of our climate mean to you? And, and what trend? what is the current trend? Where are we going? How serious should we be taking this? And in the end, what can we do about it? Uh, Bill, I'd love to throw it to you. Well, I mean, this is by far the biggest thing that human beings have ever done. Um, you know, um, it's the most radical thing you could possibly imagine. I, I Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes people will call people protesting climate change radicals, but then you stop and think for a minute. Uh, uh, our oil companies are willingly uh, altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere. They're doing it now that scientists have warned them what it's going to do, and they've done it in full view of, uh, say, the fact that they've managed to melt the Arctic in the process already. That's what's happened with one degree. Uh, the same scientists have told us that would happen, warn us to expect three, four, five degrees before the century is out. Now, everybody who looks at the there's effects of that. Uh, uh, it strains credulity to think that we're going to really be able to keep civilization as we're going, as we know it, going in that kind of scenario. So, uh, you know, um, um, that's why we need an all-out effort to counter it. Uh, not just to, I mean, uh, the good news is that science, the scientific method has worked. It's done its job. You know, most of what we need science to tell us, it's told us at this point. Where there's lots of good and interesting and useful stuff still to come. But at this point, the question is whether the rest of the professions uh, can take that data and actually do something with it, whether political science works as well as atmospheric science does. And so far, no. Yeah. No, definitely talking from a political science background and working for cities such as San Francisco, San Jose, and for the California State Legislature, I can tell you it is kind of hard and difficult to get everybody on the same page. Uh, Noah, can you uh, speak a little bit to this issue? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you know we're we're in this situation for um, you know, pretty good reasons, I would argue. Uh, you know, there there are tremendous benefits to consuming energy. Uh, fossil sources of energy are extremely dense. Uh, you, there's a lot of um, bang for the buck in terms of how much energy can be released from from what's extracted. Uh, it, the fossil sources offer you know, tremendous benefits in terms of uh, transportability and um, reliability. And you know, I've I've you know, my life is you know ha has benefited tremendously from having um, constant access to energy resources. And we're, if we look globally. Most of the world's population doesn't have that access, and a large fraction of the world's population is in energy poverty. And uh, th that's, to me, where the real tension is. That we we know that uh, that there are tremendous benefits of of energy consumption. We know that the um, you know, the system that we have in place is is a fossil-based system for reasons that that make sense from an energy access point of view. Uh, and we know that if we continue to, you know, to, to achieve human well-being by relying on that on those fossil energy sources, that the side effect of, of greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere, changes in, in the global climate system, changes in the local and regional climate, uh, particularly uh, with extreme events, that those are gonna gonna continue to to intensify, and that's that's where the real challenge is. Um, and I think how we how we both assure uh, a minimum level of, of, of acceptable human well-being for all people on planet Earth, which requires access to energy, while also um, minimizing the, the increasing stress from the climate change uh, that, that so far has been associated with that, I think is, is the real question. Well, hopefully we can learn the lessons that, uh, or adapt to the current situation with the lessons we've learned, getting our own energy up to speed and utilizing better technology for having uh, the larger issue of the energy poverty gap uh, addressed without having as much of an impact as it might if it was all fossil uh, based. Roger, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Thanks. Um, so one of the things we can think about, and I mean, in some of the, the trends and so on, Bill and certainly Noah described very well, 
Um, there's some critical things that are happening. I think it was mentioned that people are, are taking on a lot of adaptive strategies that's occurring in the public and the private sector. But something we need, when we talk about the positive aspects of those, it's not simply to say, you know, it's positive, people are doing stuff. But in fact, there are ways of securing in even economic investments by making actions on responding to climate change. And we have not really played those out as much as the benefits of, say, we're reducing disaster risk and so on. So what I'd like to, to certainly bring out is that, um, as was said earlier, you don't throw your hands up at this kind of issue. You ask, where does innovation and ingenuity take place? And then how are the needs of the things that are most impacted, you know, people in marginal communities or um, or certainly the environment are impacted. Now it's an issue, this is what just mentioned, that um, you know there's been a decline in sort of environmental reporting, but the, that may itself be a bit of an issue. Where this should really arise are in, to, in the economic pages and the culture, because what it's about is what we really value, not whether or not these impacts are major or you know, what the extent of them are, but do we value the things that might be lost and do we value the investments that we can be made to secure things that we, we, we think are important? There are a lot of co-benefits to climate adaptation strategies. And when we say, oh, well, you know, adaptation is important, but this whole energy f component of it is more important, we're actually diluting the message. We're diluting the message that, in fact, it's an across-the-board issue. All impacts of climate change and variability are felt through water. They fell through the water cycle. And so we have to be clear that we're not distracting this by simply talking about regulation, but the opportunities for securing investments, the value of having protected areas, the value of having things like marine buffers that allow us to adapt and change in, 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 as the environment changes. So when we look at the trends, that's important, but it's our short-term decisions that determine our long-term risk. And if we don't put those two together, then we're actually missing a big point in terms of how we describe this problem. One of the things we do have to get at is really how well are the things that we're putting into place. We have a lot of, a lot of activities coming out of Hurricane Sandy. We have the President's Climate Action Plan. How do we know they're going to work? The only way you know they're going to work is whether or not they help us on the near-term impacts and extremes. That's the only way we know they're going to work. Where the CO2 reduction issue comes to bear are the things that we can't manage effectively without having reductions in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, such as ocean acidification being a major one, certainly sea ice melt. Where are we seeing major changes over time? The coastal zone, high elevations of mountains, the sea ice margin, and an area we tend to ignore, but where the most rapid changes that we can see are being placed right now, which are the semi-arid margins, places like the four corners of the U.S. Southwest. The changes we have in society and economics are much bigger than any of these, but what we're, being, what we're seeing is that it no longer takes a major change to throw our system out of whack. We have to look at all of the different trends that are occurring and not simply hone in on the climate signal. Well, Seth, uh, James, I want to throw it to you to get your perspective. You've been there on the actual grounds. Can you actually talk a little bit to what you've observed on this issue? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think that one of the most important things that we can that we can approach. I mean, not not only as people working in the field, but also as scientists, is this idea of getting people to understand how important all this really is. I, I actually had a. I mean, it's it's sort of comical, but I had an interaction with this uh, kid who. Um, when I was in Greenland on on Operation Icebridge, um, 19 years old, he uh, he I think he was driving a bus for the 109th uh, Air, Airborne 109th Rescue Wing, and uh, you know he was sort of you know really interested in what we were working on, why we were out there, and I tried I tried talking to him about you know well you know a lot of our research is such and such, and it all goes into climate modeling, and I mean you know this is probably a guy who. He's in the Air Force, but probably doesn't have more than a high school education. And then you just see, you know, the sort of glazing over that that occurs when you start talking about the specifics. And I felt really bad. And it's just one of those things where I had to say, well, this is this is what I understand of it. And uh, you know, I, I tried to do my best, but 
it's really difficult to get the word out when people, it's not even on their radar. Like, uh, you know, this kid, he probably come, came from, you know, Midwestern United States, you know, places where they don't talk about climate change, or at least they don't talk about it in a very positive and educated way. And so convincing people that it's something that they have to act on, I mean, that's that's where folks like, like Bill and 350 Dark Lord become really important because you have to get the message out there because no one's going to do anything. No one's going to enact any change if they don't agree that change has to be made. That's a very good point. It actually leads us to one of the questions that was asked on our uh, board in regards to this uh, hangout. How do you communicate the complexity of climate science and the apparent, and I'm quoting here, paradoxical data without undermining the need for action to mitigate climate change? Basically, how do you commit, communicate this issue? And Bill, I know that you have a large, vast knowledge in regards to this, and I've heard various, um, you know, clips from you and sound bites from you that uh, go everywhere from we don't necessarily need to uh, convince people of the science because the science is right and the science is there. Um, but I really just want to uh, to hear what your perspective is uh, addressing that question. I think. I actually think people, uh, we've had the, uh, the experience that people are very open to this and understand it easily. Um, and even in fairly technical terms. I mean, I was talking before about how 350 was a problem. You know, people said, oh, it's too complicated, no one will ever get it. But everybody gets it. It's a number. We're too high. There's too much of it. Because there's too much of it, we have huge problems. So, with, you know, we see big, big increases in people, say to James Point, in the Midwest, understanding uh, the effects of climate change after last year's drought. It got too hot to grow corn in the most fertile farmland on earth. Okay, um, 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 If it's above 95 degrees, the crucial period of time, corn won't fertilize. Billions of kernels of corn didn't fertilize last year. Everybody who had a cornfield understood that something weird was happening. And they understood it again when we had, you know, record rains this spring that were keeping people from getting into the fields. So, the the I think that the the problem is less getting people to understand that we have a problem with climate change and more getting people to understand how rapidly that problem is developing and what large, but doable changes we need to make to deal with it. We're used to problems where the right answer is compromise. That's how human problems usually work. You know, the Democrats want this, the Republicans want that, we meet in the middle, you know, whatever. In this case, the basic underlying contest is between human beings on the one hand and physics on the other. And that's a very difficult battle to win. Physics is notoriously poor at compromise, you know. And so we need to step up. Um, that's why people push hard for change. And they do it not just in the developed world, they do it increasingly in the developing world. Uh, we just, 350.org just trained 500 young people from 135 countries in Istanbul to go back and do climate activism work. There were 5,000 young people who applied. Uh, countries like Vietnam or India or, or South Africa are, are, are now alive with young people especially trying to make a difference here. What they need is some help, some leadership from the powers that be. And we don't, I mean, what we really need is, uh, one of the things we need is scientists, leaders, others stepping up, being willing to say, I'll put myself on the line, I'll go out and do what, you know, demonstrate my resolve. Um, that helps. These are people with credibility in our society. And if we had a few more Jim Hansons out there, we'd be making some real progress. Well, Stephanie, Kate, I want to throw it to you. Uh, you have experience communicating these issues on a mass scale, and I just wanted to see if you could lend your expertise to this part of the conversation. No, I mean, I think I think the biggest challenge is getting people to connect it with with their own personal lives. I mean, I think that's getting easier um, when we see extreme weather events. People it starts to make sense to people. Um, but you know, I'm I'm largely of the belief that people don't sort of just adopt new values or beliefs or just believe something because it's a good thing to believe. I think they you need to connect the story to things that are are important to them. So I think, you know, uh, finding ways to make it relevant to their day-to-day -day lives, to show that uh, climate change is something that could affect them or their children, 
um, you know, something that affects, you know, it, it, it's a, an issue that, you know, makes our government spend a bunch of money that we don't need to spend because we're making poor decisions. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can connect this issue to things that people already care about. I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, I think a lot of times when we report on climate change, we assume that uh, people will just believe us and that it is the most, you know, that, that, that it is obviously, that it's obvious that it's the most important challenge out there. But I think we need to put in the extra work to make it, um, make people care about it through our stories. And for me, that means finding people who tell a story well, finding people, you know, finding like farmers who are being affected by it or people who live in coastal areas are being affected by it uh, and, and using those people to tell the story and trying to get others, I think, to see uh, the immediate relevance. I mean, for too long, I think a lot of the conversation about climate has been like, oh, is this something that's going to happen in the future or this is something that's going to happen to someone else in some other country. I think increasingly we need to find ways to, to, to really communicate the, the uh, sense of urgency and the proximity uh, to people here in the U.S. So, yeah. so I, always say, I, I think there is some, there is some complexity. I, you know, I think that um, in, in terms of the physics, in, in terms of how the world works, I, I think we, we certainly learn a lot about vulnerability to the climate system. Um, and through these extreme weather events, people, I, I, I think, you know, in my experience, I, I think it's what's been said is correct, that, that when people are experiencing stress from the climate system, then there's, there's, a, there's a raised awareness. Uh, but, you know, in terms of you know, trying to understand, you know, what's the, what's the contribution of, of anthropogenic global warming uh, versus the, the, quote, natural uh, internal variability in the climate system to an extreme event like the heat and drought in the United States last summer, like Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, uh, the combination of events that, that led to that event. That's some, some really challenging science, and it's science that's in progress now. It certainly uh, is in progress when the event occurs. Um, and and, and it, there, there are, I, I think, in, in terms of uh, you know, helping people understand uh, the contribution of climate change to those events that they're experiencing right now, it, it, it's, it's complex to understand scientifically for those of us who are, who are doing the work, and that, that only enhances the, the challenge of communication. So I just wanted to add a little bit from a communication standpoint. Um, even if we have this issue of trying to understand the human effect on climate change or not, Really, we know and we've seen from the data that these 100-year events are happening more and more rapidly. We know that we're experiencing just extreme weather aspects. And in the end, uh, we can know that adapting to it proactively uh, and alternative to retroactively is going to be cheaper in the long run and less crazy. Uh, from my own personal standpoint, my own personal background, my father 10 years ago actually invested in solar paneling. Um, for his house up in Sacramento, not because he's an eco-enthusiast, uh, not because he's got liberal ideals to save the world, because in the long run he knew that this would save him money. And he knew that in the long run uh, it would be this uh, self-interested, self-supporting uh, you know, method to, in the long run, save him money and a lot of hassle in paying energy bills. So in trying to speak to a larger public, about how we can, or how there's a need to address these issues and to adapt ourselves to a different uh, means of interacting with the world can really easily be, uh, well not necessarily easily, but can be shifted in a way where it's more of a personal attachment to what the, those future effects would be on our pocketbooks and our own effort. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that we are running out of time, and so, so I wanted to wrap it up so that everybody can give their final thoughts. Uh, first of all, I'd love to throw it to Roger. Can you uh, give me sure. a because it builds on something you just said. You know, it's easy to t ask people to be proactive. I always tell be people, let's be proactive. You first. <laughs> and, and the idea with that is there's something upfront about that, right? So when we talk about um, communication and awareness, we know very well from the environmental record from the experience we have on health, that communication and awareness only gets you so far. It doesn't necessarily produce action. And what produces action are a couple things, right? People that lead, partnerships, and awareness of something you were just saying, Andrew, which is why should I expect to be better off from doing this? And by better off, I don't necessarily mean just economically, right? But why the things that I hold important 
whether it's things like salmon, whether it's protected areas, why are they as valuable to what I think is important in the, the future? When we resonate with those kinds of issues, that's when we've seen change over time. So activism is, I think, extremely critical. It brings things to bear in the public. The other 60% you've seen around the world where people are trying to set up things like the, in development agencies like the pilot program and climate resilience, getting people involved in planning the president's climate action plan. But when we talk to people who come out and say, look, I don't buy this climate change stuff, and we ask, you know, if we work with you now on your droughts, your floods, and your wildfires, into the future, planning becomes easier. The flexibility to change becomes easier. It lets you hedge. In an adaptation setting, that works. We've seen it. It's empirical. And why we're missing is actually in training a whole bunch of folks, not just to communicate, but really to understand how we make decisions and how we get information into the things that people value. Thank Without you. that, you know, there's an old Gandhian saying, it's really great to stand in a corner and say how right we are, but you've got to get out of that corner every now and then. All right, Bill, I want to throw it to you for your final thoughts. Uh, just my final thoughts are just to say thanks to James, to Noah, and Roger for their science and to Pete for her journalism and you. Um, this is a, um, you know, and thank you. Sci the scientific, the scientific method has never been, never worked better. You know, when people go back to look at the history of science, they'll be amazed that in the course of a couple of decades we were able to come to a workable consensus on a difficult problem in physics and chemistry and have the rough outlines of what we need to do, which is stop burning coal and gas and oil as soon as is ever possible, and actually somewhat sooner. Um, and, and the question now is just can we do it, and that will require all kinds of skill sets to make it happen. It requires economists, it requires theologians, it requires psychologists, it requires accountants, it requires engineers, it requires most of all citizens. It requires most of all those, all of us doing whatever we do during the day when we work and then after hours going and being active as citizens to make change happen. We have huge vested interests that would like to keep things the way they are. The fossil fuel industry makes more money than any industry on Earth. Left to their own devices, they will keep things the way they are past the point where, uh, past really the point of no return. So if we're going to challenge them along with all other work, we need to do the work of citizens. We can't uh, uh, outspend them, so we'll have to be more creative, more passionate, more spirited, more unified, more together. And the good news I can tell you from around the world is that increasingly that's what's happening. The best now. All right, Kate, I'd love to throw it to you for your final thoughts. Uh, I believe I can hear you. Okay, sorry, I have a mute on. Um, yes. I, I was just say, you know, right now in Washington, uh, we're we're in, uh, they're having the big celebration on the Mall for the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, um, and to me that really is a good reminder of of how much people can accomplish by getting out in the streets and demanding change. Um, and also a reminder of how fast things can change. You know, 50 years ago, uh, you know, ending segregation in the U.S. seemed like this huge, insurmountable thing. And now it's happened and things change so quickly and it's, you know, really, you barely recognize, I think, the country today as it was then. And that to me just says a lot, I think, about um, how fast we can move and how fast we can change things if we get people to really put their, you know, act, beliefs into action and get out there and, and make it happen. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to, I think, I think I'm overall uh, positive about the ability to change things um, and, to, and to really demand action on climate and, and, and to use that to, to, to make the change happen. Excellent. Great final thoughts. Uh, Noah, I'd like to send it to you. I yeah, know this has been, been a great discussion. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And, um, you know, from the scientist perspective, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of challenging scientific questions out there, and um, there's a big community of people who are working hard to, to try to try to answer them. So uh, we'll keep at it. Well, definitely check out more of your hangouts in the future. Thank you for coming on, James. Final thoughts? Um, yeah, I don't think I really can add too much more to what Bill already threw out there. Um, other than um, if you're someone who's interested in global climate change. Uh, Try not to be too overwhelmed. 
And uh, also, there's a lot of free and easy to access data out there. Um, I mean, with the groups that I work with, you know, we have the uh, NSIDC. We also have uh, the NASA Airborne Sensor Facility. All this data is free. You just have to go and ask for it, and they'll give it to you. Um, so let let your curiosity guide you, and hopefully that will lead to better things. Yay, free data. Um, <laughs> Well, today's been another epic hangout. Uh, if I had to give my final thoughts for today, it would be that each and every single one of us needs to start paying more attention and be more mindful of our impact on the planet. I also believe that we, uh, together, as was mentioned uh, earlier by Kate and others, can make a big impact by working together, getting out there, and actually putting a little bit more pressure on our elected officials to get things done. Once again, big thank you to all of our participants and viewers. Together, we can work towards fixing and adapting to this problem. Thank you again for watching, and see you next time.